Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you to the organisers for giving me this opportunity to present uh, kind of an overview of what we're planning to do uh, on my experiment. So yeah, as Simon said, I'm going to talk about Zeeman cis-first deceleration of molecules, and uh, this follows on quite nicely from the, the previous two talks. So I'm going to start off by giving a quick motivation for the project. I will then discuss the kind of the concept and the design of this decelerator, um, then summarize some of our results that we've got from simulations, and finally give a little experimental update. So laser cooling has, as we've heard over the course of this week, advanced hugely over the last few years and we've seen great success. Um, for people who aren't familiar with the numbers, um, just quickly, if you take your buffer gas source of molecules, this tends to have a forward velocity in the region of 140 meters per second. Um, the velocity change per photon is kind of on the order of a centimeter per second. So that means we have to scatter kind of 10 to 20,000 photons to decelerate in order to capture in a mop. And this leads to some problems which have been highlighted by the previous two speakers. So firstly, you know, you need to have this very close transition, although as we heard from Anna, maybe there's exciting possibilities of getting around having a high Frank Condon factor. Um, the transition frequency is very important. As Stefan highlighted, if you can go to very short wavelengths, then you can have very short slowing distances, but you may need to have an in-house laser technician. Um, and finally, every time you scatter a photon, you actually cause some heating. And this can lead to this kind of pluming effect of your beam as it slows down. And all of these three things combined can make it quite difficult to load a uh, magneto-optical trap. So one question is, can we reduce the number of scattering events? Now I'm gonna answer this in a way that's different to the last two speakers. So the way that we're going to go about it is we're gonna use the, the Zeeman effect again. But here we're going to create alternate spatially varying magnetic fields um, in a way like this. So this means that if your molecule is traveling into this region of high field, it can see a potential hill. As it climbs the hill, it will lose some kinetic energy, and then we can pump it when it gets to the top into this opposite spin state. As it enters a field of low magnetic field, it will again see a potential hill, and we can pump it back, and we can keep doing this process, and we will decelerate the molecule hence the Sisyphus aspect of the Zeeman Sisyphus decelerator. So the maximum um, energy that you can lose per stage is basically twice your total Zeeman shift that you can impart. And this depends on the magnetic moment of the state and the magnetic field. So if we think about a spin half molecule where we can, where we create a field of about a Tesla, then we get a energy change per state of about 28, 28 gigahertz. If we compare this back to our buffer gas source, which is traveling at 140 meters per second, this corresponds to about 1400 gigahertz of energy. So we should be able to remove all of this velocity with just 50 stages, which corresponds to only 100 photon scatters. So how can we do this in reality? So we need to create this spatially varying magnetic field. And we choose to do this with um, permanent magnet arrays. So you can basically, you can create these fallback cylinders. Um, and if you make them out of these kind of wedge magnets, which have um, magnetic, which are magnetized in different directions, you can create in this so-called K equals two symmetry, you create this very large uniform magnetic field, which here is, pointing along the positive x direction. And then if you align your magnetic wedges in a different way, you can create areas of low magnetic field. We can then interleave these magnetic um, wedge cylinders and create a decelerator that's gonna look something like this. So this design was first proposed by uh, Noah Fitch and Mike Tarbot. And the concept has been demonstrated in the Doyle group where they use um, very large superconducting magnet magnetic coils in order to decelerate molecules in with only two stages. So we now have our kind of experimental setup. What do we need from our molecule? Well, in as Silke already <laughs> described, um, 
we basically want to get into this passion back regime where the molecule is only in ms is plus one or spin so the project of the spin is either spin up or spin down so then you end up with these two manifolds which are separated by you know, kind of 30 30 gigahertz then in your um, excited state you want very little splitting so this comes naturally um, with this in this a doublet pi a half state because the spin and the angular orbital momenta are basically equal and, and opposite which means you get cancellation and this leads to a very small splitting in your excited state so we've been working on some simulations of how this decelerator could work with um, calcium fluoride of the test molecule and by doing quantum monte carlo we can essentially take our initial buffer gas beam we can decelerate it down through the or we propagate it through the decelerator and we get a kind of broad um, pulse leaving the decelerator at the end where we do have some molecules down at below this kind of 24 meters per second capture velocity for a calcium fluoride mole. Um, and take it with a pinch of salt, but if we scale this up to what we think a, a buffer gas source might provide in terms of flux, then maybe we could capture half a million molecules in a magneto optical trap. So we also then had a look at what the phase space is when you, as for the molecules, as they leave the decelerator. So this is here a plot um, showing the velocity versus the position of the molecules as they exit. Um, one of the reasons we looked into this is because we were worried that the beam was just going to plume out. Um, and in fact, the kind of transverse velocity distribution is very small for the molecules leaving. But, okay, we could still, maybe we could gain by collimating the beam afterwards if we were to want to load into a lot. So here we've uh, solved the optical block equations to look at transverse cooling of the calcium fluoride beam. And we tried this for various different magnetic fields because, as I said, our static magnetic field reaches a Tesla. So is this um, cooling even going to work in the vicinity of the decelerator? So if you look at the scalar magnetic field versus distance from the end of the decelerator, it actually drops off pretty quickly. And within kind of three to four centimeters, the magnetic field is in the order of a Gauss. Um, so this transverse cooling should work pretty well. Unfortunately, out of so only a small proportion of the molecules make it into the decelerator, and of the ones that make it in, only about 4% actually make it through to the end. So maybe one place where we could really gain here is actually putting this transverse cooling before the decelerator, so collimating our beam after the source. Um, yeah, so this is, the, this is basically the problem. So here we've got a plot showing the trajectories of some of the molecules as they travel through the decelerator. And you can just see this huge number just come flying in and just hit the walls of the decelerator and are lost. So if we um, run some simulations where we do we refer, re refer to it as idealized collimation. So we aren't simulating the transverse cooling here at all. We're just saying that it's going to work. So we, uh, we collimate our beam. You know, people have shown that transverse cooling works, so hopefully that's uh, not too big of a stretch. Um, and we can see that if we take this now collimated beam, we can get three times as many molecules through the decelerator. And in fact, we end up with four times as many in this little regime beneath the, the mock capture velocity. So this is maybe a way of loading a, a decent sized molecular mock. So the um, experimental status of the, of the group. So for those of you who don't know, I started working at Durham under two years ago and come January 2022, this was my lab. Um, but we jumped forward nine months and we got the metaphorical key to the, to the lab, but uh, so we're still waiting on the funding and the equipment and I'm sure everyone who's an experimentalist understands the, the pain involved. But as of two weeks ago, um, we now have a 
vacuum chamber for our source um, and we have a cryo uh, cryo head in here and most importantly we have two happy smiling students working in the lab so in conclusion um so Siemens CISPRS deceleration seems to be a promising um, technique for slowing molecules, especially those which are maybe harder to, to laser cool directly. Um, combined with transverse cooling, this could be um, particularly powerful. And on a kind of experimental basis, we hope to very soon have calcium chloride molecules and then be able to test its decelerator in the coming year or so. So with that, I just have to thank my PhD student, Bethan, who, having signed up for an experimental PhD, has spent 18 months without a lab, um, but now she's, now she's in. Um, James Crilly was my master's student who wrote all of the simulations for the Siemens CISPRS decelerator, and then Keelan's been working with us over summer, helping to set up the source chamber and start working on some of the lasers. So yeah, I also have to acknowledge the the funding for this and thank you for listening. Thank you very much Hannah, perfectly on time so time for questions. Okay then at the back, this is going to be a good one. I, uh, so obviously one of the goals is that you might be able to do these non-laser coolable molecules. If it does work brilliantly with calcium chloride, what's the first non-laser coolable molecule you would try it on? I would try it on. Or you would suggest someone else try it on. Um, I don't know what the first one would be. Not barium fluoride. <laughs> we have, so we ran some simulations for that and it was uh, predicted to have an 18 meter decelerator. So my lab is not that big. Um. <laughs> how, how many photons do you scatter in the in the like in your simulations? Like how many photons are required for the Siemens CISPRS? Um, so for the the calcium chloride um, simulations, we had about eighty stages, and I think we were scattering on average three to four photons per stage. questions? Don't see any, so let's thank you.